You know, it's always a mixed experience to hear your biography. And I realized that there was something missing there. I'm a, also an FRM holder. Are there other FRM certified uh, individuals here tonight? Anyone besides me? There are a few. Uh, I'm going to express some views tonight. So I'll start the way everyone from the Fed starts which is to just point out that the views are mine. And I have learned from hard experience that they are not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago and the Federal Reserve System. Um, I'm going to say, you know, soon enough, that I think I've solved the problem. And so the first item of business is to try to set up that there's a problem worth solving. And like four slides on that. The solution is simple and easy. So that's two slides. Uh, I'm going to show you that it works on historical data. And I'm going to claim that it'll work for the rest of your career. That's saying a mouthful. And here's a slide that's easy to handle. I'm just going to skip it. Here's the, you know, where things sort of get going. The topic, I mean, what I talk about in the title is LGD and default rates. But the reason any of that's important is because of credit loss. And sort of the fundamental, you know, identity of credit loss is that it's, you can decompose it into two parts. This, lo this loss rate is the product of two other rates, the default rate and the LGD rate. Now for that, you know, arithmetic to work out, you have to assume all the exposures are the same. And we have the luxury of doing that. We're analyzing rates and statistical properties of rates. So uh, we don't care how many dollars a particular borrower owes to a particular lender. You know, we're going to just abstract from that and just say that all loans, you know, have an exposure of $10. And we'll just look at the rates, the default rate and the loss given default rate. And the rest of this slide is just demonstrating that this relationship is so. Uh, the default rate, well, uh, well, let's go through here. So there's 10 loans. Each of them have an exposure of $10. And three of them default, loan four, six, nine default, and those three have losses associated with them, 10%, 20%, and 30%. So you'd say the default rate, 30%, three out of 10 loans default. The LGD rate, well, you could average 10%, 20%, and 30% and get 20. Or you could also just take the total loss and spread it over the three firms that default, you're gonna get same number. And then the loss rate is the product of these two things. Six dollars in a hundred, that's the loss rate. Or sure enough, it's 30 by times 20. So that's the, this is the most uh, sophisticated quantitative slide, you know, in this presentation. That's kind of as deep, you know, as we're gonna get with equal signs and stuff, but it's just, you know, pointing out that if credit loss depends on these two other things, the default rate and the loss given default rate. And it turns out, I mean, that has to be true, right? I mean, this is arithmetic. Is there's, you could kind of QED this thing, and that is, by definition, got to be true. Here's what doesn't have to be true, but is true, is if you look in the data, the two things move together. The blue line is tracing out default rates on this axis, and the red line is tracing out LGD rates on the other axis. And these are the rates that are observed by Ed Altman of NYU, the grand old man of, you know, <laughs> he's uh, older than me, if you can, if you can absorb that fact. But uh, Ed has st sort of started this uh, field of inquiry uh, way back. So Ed's been doing this since 1984, keeping track of default rates and LGD rates. And really, you can't go back much farther than that. That's the start of the world, is the early 80s in this stuff. 
You know, in the early 80s, uh, Michael Milken hadn't even gone to prison yet. <laughs> if, if you look at the portfolio, uh, the set of U.S. bonds in the 1970s, it was all really high-grade stuff that would not reliably default under stressful conditions. You, we have Michael Milken to thank, you know, that there's any data for Ed Altman to analyze at all. So you go back 30 years, that's the beginning of the, the, the first moment yeah, of time. And then you look forward on the blue line, and sure enough, there's been three high default episodes that have occurred. And they correspond, this is US data, so these high default episodes correspond with recessions in the US. The, uh, the real estate recession of 1990-91, you know, that's when the bankers learned how to really underwrite commercial lending, commercial real estate lending, you know, well, so that we wouldn't have to worry about commercial real estate induced recessions anymore. There was that one, and then there was the technology bubble, and then this most recent thing, whatever you're going to call that, which, you know, as far as the default rates on junk bonds go, at Altman's world, it wasn't, you know, such a severe event, just on everything else, but default rate on junk bonds, not so bad. So that's the, this is as much data as anyone can ever get on this stuff. About 30 years, three recessions, that's it. That's the default side. And you can see that every time there's a spike on the default rate, there's an associated spike on the LGD rate. That's the point I'm trying to make here. When the default rate goes up, the LGD rate also, historically, tends to go up. And you could tell yourself a story that that makes a lot of sense. In stressful conditions, there's probably a lot of firms that default. And when they do default, the losses are probably pretty big. Um, that's really, the, I guess, the only point of this slide. The two rates, in fact, are correlated. Yeah. This thing here, what was, what was happening in 85? And you're the second person to ask me that question today. And uh, for the second time, I'll say, I don't really remember exactly what it was. But I think, I, you know, maybe I have an inkling. I think what happened here was there was a slug of defaults in companies that were very closely related to each other, sort of part of the same corporate structure. And they were counted by firm in Ed Altman's way of looking at things. I think that's what happened, but I'd feel better if I went back and looked. It's been years since I've really known. Yeah. So the high yield flow is a pretty small slice of the overall credit spectrum. Yes, the high yield world is a small slice, but this is where you see the dynamism in, in rates. Yeah, and this is also where you see systematic behavior. You know, the really good stuff, the, the, the investment grade stuff, when that stuff defaults, it's because the firm goes bad. The, something about the firm goes bad. This stuff is the stuff that defaults because the economy goes bad. When the economy is in stress, there's a whole slug of this stuff goes bad on you. So this is where you really see the systematic influence rather than the idiosyncratic influence. Yeah. 8485 was Penn Square. Oh. That's right, was Penn Square. Yeah. So that may be the way into that answer. Yeah. Since we're taping this one tonight, you might find us parroting some of the questions just so they won't disappear from the, for those of our yeah. Southern Illinois friends that may be listening to this. Thanks for reminding me of that. So there's that. So, and who knows? Uh, you might care about this. Well, you showed up at this thing, you know, which you probably have a really good networking hour after this. So, you know, maybe you care about this, maybe you don't. But uh, you might. Uh, in three different kinds of people might care. You know, if you were trying to assess how much capital you need to do this kind of lending, you might care. Because as you saw, those LGDs were going from 50 to 70 or so, you know, some number like that. 
gee, that's a you know, 40% increase. Maybe you, need, maybe you have to capitalize for that. You know, at a finer texture, uh, you know, maybe you don't care if a loan goes from 50 to 70 loss. But if you had a loan that went from 10 to 30 loss, well, you would care. You want to get paid more for making that loan because that's the one that's going to hit you hard when you have the least financial ability to withstand that kind of hit. So there's that. And then there's when you price stuff, the similar kind of logic comes about. You, know, you don't make loans to just one kind of firm, but a whole spectrum. Or more concretely, you know, if you're setting up a securitization where there are tranches, you know, and uh, the one tranche is hit in the routine recession and the other tranche is exposed to only very severe conditions, default rates will be different, yeah, when those tranches are in jeopardy, but LGD rates, they're going to be different too. So for any of these uses, the connection between default and LGD is something you might want to model up. And the question is going to be, how much? You know, how do you quantify that? If the default rate does something, how much does the LGD rate respond to that? That's where we're going. Yeah? Is this all your artificial gas because Yeah. The question there is, are we kind of like uh, making work for ourselves here? What anybody ought to care about is credit loss. Yeah. And the fact that you can mathematically decompose that into a default rate and an LGD rate, interesting, but is it really vital? And uh, the, uh, the question uh, expresses a deep insight, in fact. And I feel myself, you know how you, you go to one of those cliffs, you know, you go to the cliff and you walk out to the edge of the cliff and you think, oh my gosh, I might lose my mind and jump over the cliff and so I'm going to like step back. I'm having one of those experiences right now. There's, there's uh, uh, all too often default and LGD are analyzed as if those are the important things, and they're not. What's important is credit loss. Now, it might be easier to get statistical observations on default rates and LGD rates, but the point always will be to bring this back to credit loss. That's what counts. The only reason for this distinction is it's easier to gather data on default rates and LGD rates and uh, harder to get, because um, when you get data, right, it want, you want to reflect a known situation. Well, with default rates, there's different kinds of borrowers. And with LGDs and loans, there's different kinds of loans. And so there's a multiplicity of things you're collecting, and that's bad enough. But if you cross those together, every kind of borrower with every kind of loan, you'll never get more data than dust. You know, you don't get enough N to it, to analyze it properly. That's why statisticians split this, but that's exactly the point. These have to be brought, back to, brought together, and that's why the paper that you'll see cited has the words credit loss as the first two in the title. Yeah? So I, I don't trade in bonds, but I have um, uh, commercial trading activities yep. with counterparts where uh, delivery and payment assumes a certain amount of credit risk unrelated potentially to their bonds because they might be private companies that don't um, have bonds that are listed or what have you. And yet I still have to get a credit analysis of that counterparty. I still have to assign a loss given default to that counterparty and an expected uh, recovery so that I can assess whatever market premium I might need on the product or um, the holding of a certain amount of collateral for protection. For yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this, That's, this model fits in, in that same context. Yes, it does. The question for listeners that didn't hear that uh, amplified is that uh, this is uh, 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 the, 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 the statistical question here is one that has relevance uh, even for 
uh, situations where there is no portfolio lending. Uh, there will still be an LGD, and that LGD will still change over time. And what I claim is that I can show you how that'll happen. And here's how. That if you have a big portfolio, very big, and if it's ideal, then it'll produce data along a line that sort of has that shape. And this is the, oh, and what shape is it? Well, it's, it slopes up. You know, that's the first thing to observe here. If the default rate is elevated, the LGD rate is also going to go up if you're on the blue line. And uh, I wanted to show you my skill with uh, a PowerPoint presentation here, because this is pretty cool. I click into this, something happens. Because what if you didn't like that blue line, yeah? Well, the thing is, hey, here's the deal. I've got other blue lines, OK? That's the only point of the, uh, you want a blue line? That's, OK, so if you expect loss to be low on your, you're going to want a lower line. That's, you know. Now, this is one of the things that makes this super simple, right? You can adjust kind of the height of this line, but you can't adjust the slope. The slope is baked in by the function itself. All you can do is make it higher or lower. You expect LGDs to be higher? Well, fine. You're on one of the higher lines. That's all that slide illustrates. Um, but it was sure fun putting it together. And I wanted to show that to you. So that's the deal with that. Uh, yeah, it really is that simple. I'm sorry. Uh, any other questions? <laughs> well, we get that same functionality on the yeah. website for the spreadsheet when the presentation is posted on the yeah. That's a good question. Uh, when they post yeah. this, will it be embedded in the, uh, in the PowerPoint? Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because you have it here. So uh, you'll have it. You'll have the, yeah. So you'll be able to move that thing around, and it's really exciting. So there. So it's easy to use, right? All you have to do I mean, is, like, you want one that's up there? Well, pick one that's up there is what I can tell you. If you have a swarm of data that you think is, reflects the risk you've got, well, you're going to pick a line that kind of like goes through the middle of the data swarm, pretty much. You know, just like with linear regression. The line goes through the center of the data swarm. It's not exactly the same here because it's not a linear regression, but it's close. It's gonna, the line's going to go through the center of the, the middle of the data swarm. And you're not going to have to do any fancy statistics. Just take some averages. What average loss given default do you expect? That's the most important thing that will establish the, the position of that line. So it is, I mean, I haven't shown you that it's good, right, yet. <laughs> Hopefully I do get to that. <laughs> uh, but it's easy to use. That's the point here. Easy. Easy and simple. And People usually are a little uncomfortable with this because it's a deep simplicity. And I'm not going to show you all the ins and outs of this tonight. But there is a deep simplicity here. You saw one aspect of that, though. There's only one line that passes through any given point. You can make the line higher or lower, but you can't make it steeper or flatter. That's the property of this function. So it's it's easy, and it does have this sort of deep simplicity, and you can fight your way through the article. And, uh, and few people have. But I'm interested in your experiences as you give it a try. You know, <laughs> Please tell me what you think if you give it a shot. OK, what that article shows, if you fight your way through it, is that this darn thing works. Simple as it is, it does seem to work. Now, here's the problem we had in making that demonstration. There's no statistical estimates in that function. There's no way I can show you that it's statistically significant, you know, because there's no statistical. I mean, there's an, e L, there's an expected LGD, right? What LGD do you expect? That's in there. And I guess that matters. That's 
significant. You know, that's not zero, that's for darn sure. That matters a lot. But there's no other statistics in there. There's no way to demonstrate that this thing has statistical significance. So what we did was to work the other way around. We had to, to devise a function that contained another parameter, which we called A, because it first thing that occurred to us. So this function, it contains an additional parameter A. That function can have any old slope you want, and then we show that that parameter is not statistically significant, right? We have our null hypothesis. It's dumb as a box of rocks. There's nothing to estimate. We throw in an additional parameter that lets the slope be steep or flat, and we show that that parameter does not matter. It's not significant. That's how it, wor that's how it works. It's a little bit other way up from the way you usually think of a statistical test. My question is, you know, Sebastian was questioning um, high yield bonds, how much of the market is that? When you get to things like millions of consumer loans, you actually get a nice amount of default and a nice amount of loss for any data set. What data set were we talking about here? Yes. The data set that I illustrated uh, earlier, Ed Altman's data set, this is corporate junk bonds. I think he calls them high yield. Uh, this model, to date, has not been calibrated to retail lending. The, uh, the main difficult, the, of course, the richest set of data would be credit cards. But most people are like I am, you know, when it comes to credit cards. I guarantee, if I ever default on a credit card, the LGD is going to be my limit. Yeah? And that's, I think, sort of reflects the data, that there's very little variation in, L, in, in credit card LGD. Everybody maxes out before they default. I'm desperately curious about home mortgages. And we have a research project. The, 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 uh, uh, we're investigating that. Um, you know, car loans would be nice if I could get a nice data set of that. So if anybody has, you know, 10 years of car loans data and they'd like to, uh, we'll get a summer intern and beat, beat up the, yeah, Dan? And you start talking about loans, another variable comes into <coughs> what you'll get back out of it, and that's the loan value. Yes. Does the junk bond data have anything similar? Uh, the question, and it's an interesting one, is does the junk bond data have something that's akin to loan to value? And what Ed has is a classification by seniority. So it is akin to an LTV, but not quantified the same way. Uh, the the, the impact on the function, though, is not through seniority, but by expected LGD. So your LTV, the loan to value ratio, would, fit, would figure into the expected LGD and affect the height of the blue line that we were looking at. But what Ed has is just seniorities. And, you know, as you may know, there's some research that says maybe seniority is not the best way to distinguish between different levels of corporate exposure, uh, but that's what he's got. So now I'm going to try to show you that this darn thing works. Here's the way the function works when you augment it by A. And I've shown you five different functions here. One of them is where this, val uh, this parameter A takes the value 1. And when that happens, you just get a constant function. You know, LGD is always, well, 30% in this case, uh, no matter what happens to the default rate. Yeah? There's no sensitivity at all. And you make A bigger, like 1 or like, like 2, and lo and behold, there's a it's actually downward sloping then. Or you make A smaller, and you get something upward sloping. When A is 0, that's our hypothesis. That's when A drops out of the model vanishes, 
that blue line is the same as the blue line we were looking at a few slides ago. Exactly the same. It collapses to the null hypothesis. And if you make A even less, you get something steeper. So as far as this model goes, when you throw in the A, it lets the function be steep or flat, whatever you want it can do. And this is a, so there are these five here, you know, these all have expected LGD of 30%. There'd be another, you know, suite of these lines that have an expected LGD of 50 or 20 or whatever you want. You know, there's, you can still move, you know, up and down. And this A lets you crank around. That's the thing. It lets you estimate a slope as well as a level to the LGD default relationship. Does that make sense? Did I say that confusing enough or does somebody still understand me? Yeah, we okay here? I'm going to go ahead then, and I'm going to show you how it calibrates the data, okay? It could wind up on any of these lines or anything in between. We found a way to calibrate this parameter A to Moody's rated loans. It turns out in recent years, Moody's rates loans and bonds, you know, but they rate more loans then they rate bonds. The Moody's database these days is mostly a loan database. And they're rated just like bonds are. You know, there's BA3 and B1 and all that stuff. And so we took the Moody's universe from the first day that they rated a loan, which was in 1995. So we had calendar 96 is our first data, data point and had 14 years of data on Moody's rated loans, and we have in five rating grades that are of importance. There's BA3, it's junk stuff, BA3, B1, B2, B3, and anything with a C in it, you know, C, there's C, there's CAA, there's CA, there's a bunch of things. <laughs> anything less than B3 is a C as far as we're concerned, lump it all together. Okay, so there's five sets of rating grades that we analyze simultaneously. So all of these grades are telling us something about the degree of systematic stress in each of the 14 years of our data set. That's the setup. Okay. And we ask the data, which of these lines do you like the best? Or is there one that's, you know, in between that you like even better? Here's what the data says. I'm sorry, is there some reason why you capped it at BA3 and not BA1? If yes. Well, yes. The, uh, and just the number of defaults. <laughs> it's just the, how many default, you got, only the loans that default tell you anything about LGD, yeah. So, uh, and it's murder, the, all this, this was murder. This was by far the most difficult thing that I will ever do, <laughs> was cal doing this test. And if a grade just doesn't have many defaults, it's just not gonna show up on my computer. It's that simple. It's not telling me anything, it's not in there. So that's the setup. Let's ask the data, what value of A fits the Moody's data the best 14 years? And the, I've, oh, this, uh, setting up this slide was also murder because I was really trying to show two lines here, okay? And the two lines, they're the blue line, that's the one we've been looking at several times already. That's the LGD function. You know, it's down here at 20% and goes up there. Now, that shape is the null hypothesis and the, the, what looks like the, like the dotted yellow line down the middle of the road, <laughs> that thing is the shape calibrated to the data. Okay, the blue line is the null hypothesis, the LGD function st straight, and the yellow dotted line, that's what happens when you calibrate it to Moody's data. And it turns out the, prefer the, the data point that the, 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 the parameter value that the data like the best is you know close to zero, 0 0.01. And so you get this yellow line that, believe it or not, is slightly shallower than the than the LGD function. So it's you know it's a remarkably well, it's a surprising result. You know, we worked out the blue line, and I could work out the blue line on this board in you know three minutes. There's some math involved. You can work out the blue line, it's not a big deal. Underneath the yellow line was months of effort to extract data properly from the data set, to devise the right PDF to 
maximize you know, a likelihood to uh, devise uh, alternatives that would collapse properly to the null hypothesis. There's a ton of work under that yellow line, and it turns out the Moody's data agrees almost exactly with the null hypothesis. How did you define off given the I defined, uh, the question is, how did we, did we define loss given default? And we defined it just like Moody's does. What, what Moody's does when a loan, and it's, this is an important question. When, when uh, a Moody's rated bond or loan defaults, what Moody's does is call around and find out what the thing is worth. In the week or so after the default event, they call bond brokers or loan brokers and try to either find a trade price or some kind of run on that instrument. The reason people get their loans rated is to get them traded in markets. So there is such a thing as a loan you know, broker. So this is a different concept from the LGD that a bank would experience yeah, holding the loan to mature. It's a different way of, it's what the market thinks maybe, what the loss will be ultimately. But the, uh, it's the market view of the loss at the time of default, which is not such a bad thing. If you're trying to measure you know, loss given default, it's not such a bad thing to check in at the time of default and see what the loss is you know, at that time, rather than over the full time uh, that the thing settles to final cash. So uh, that we use the same definition that Moody's uses. Yeah. Um, what's your default rate? Is it default oh, rate? Oh, there's, let's see, we have, maybe I'll take the question, since you've asked the question and we're in a dead heat here, let me ask, what's the question in the back of the room? Um, what's your default rate? Is it the Say again, I'm sorry. What's your default rate? What's the default rate? Yeah, is it of the default rate or the Moody's default rate assigned? Oh, oh, oh no, we, no uh, this is all, uh, we did our own you know, extraction of data. The Moody's observes the default events. Now with bonds, that's very well defined. If the payment is a day late, that's a default and that's the end of the story in the bond world. But we were analyzing loan data. So I called them and asked them, what does it exactly mean? And the, uh, I did not get a bright line answer. Uh, uh, that much I remember. Uh, uh, but again, uh, Moody's, uh, uh, has a table, you know, called here are the defaults. And if that loan is listed and here's the date, that's when Moody's observes the default. It's really a question for Moody's more than me. We just took uh, Moody's observations of the defaults and, you know, counted the, de uh, we used annual data. There's a certain number of firms that are exposed at the beginning of the year. Of those firms, there are some that default in the course of the year. The ratio of defaults to exposures, that's our default rate. So your data set is annual default rate and annual LGD. That is correct. Non-overlapping annual periods. What do you think of that by the what do you think of that by the way? Um, yeah, I just want to know what what's your Yeah, that's how we do it. Um, to do the statistics, ultimately we're going to assume that you know we have that years represent independent draws. So better than monthly. Any other? There was, uh, yes, you had a question. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. The uh, question here is why do you care about ratings? Because you know the point is the thing either the defaults, you know, or it doesn't. The uh, and Ed Altman doesn't. Right to him, he's tracking the entire junk bond world. Some of these junk bonds would have ratings of B something, and others are the Walking Dead. Yeah, in his in his universe, he doesn't care uh, what the rating is. Well, we do. We're interested in a function 
that is particular to a particular loan. We want to get this down to the point where if you have a loan, you can find an LGD function that works for that loan, given its probability of expected probability of default, and given its expected loss given default. Given those two numbers, you will find a blue line that works for that particular loan. So this is not a general thing that would apply to a portfolio that had a particular mix of good stuff and bad stuff and all that. No. This is getting right down to the loan level. That's why we, that's why we uh, have to be aware of that. So in a way, you're kind of depending upon the predictive, predictive uh, skills of the of, of movies. Yes. Yes. We are treating the, tech, the question here is, well, you're trusting the, um, the ratings of Moody's. And uh, yes, we are. We, and in fact, we're, we go further than that. The technical point for the people that enjoy technical points is we're assuming that the PD is uniform within each Moody's rating grade. And uh, uh, And you might not like that. So come up with something better. You know, we want to study historical default rates, and we want to study collections of things that default at similar rates. Yeah? So it's going to be somebody's opinion. You know, maybe it's KMV's opinion about what an analogous situation is. We, we just took, we take Moody's. OK. So that's, yeah. Yes. Yes, that's right. We are, uh, and the the way the model looks, the the fact that's being pointed out here, is that if you take a rating grade today, it has a much different and lower default rate than that same rating grade did three years ago. The way the model looks at that particular fact is that conditions are less stressful now than they were three years ago. Yes, default rates go up and down. The way the model looks at that is that's because levels of stress go up and down. There's a, I am having that cliff sense. You know, I'm right at the edge of the cliff here. Did you also consider the uh, selective defaults? Because you were talking about the ratings. Say again? I'm sorry. You were talking about the ratings. Uh, they have the yeah. uh, default, and they also have SD, selective default, and which is like a company may choose to default on a certain loan. Yeah. Uh, so you also consider them as those uh, as defaults? We, again, followed Moody's in this. Uh, in particular, this is Moody's loans. And if Moody's observed a default on a loan, that was a default for us. We know that there are cases where a firm refrains from defaulting on a loan where they do, in fact, default on publicly traded debt. That does happen. It doesn't happen to us because we were studying. In the, what I'm showing you tonight, we studied loans. We just took, if, if Moody said it's, they defaulted, they defaulted. It's as simple as that. I have a question about the, the, the LGD definition. Yeah. Yeah, the question here is, is our definition of LGD faulty? Because we're just looking at what the market says at the time of default. Ought we not you know, like take this out to final recovery? And um, <clears throat> certain, uh, and the argument, I think, uh, can be made that the final recovery is a valid measure of loss for those institutions that survive to make a final recovery. It, something can be said on the other side, though, 
if you're really interested in the survival of institutions in lenders that may not survive to re, uh, obtain full recovery, then maybe the market view is the better one. Maybe I can just answer that. Uh, I'm thinking that the, the, the price at which that loan is being quoted one month after will probably have that value of recovery embedded into it in some sense. Like, right? you know, if it is $1,000, if, if, if whoever is giving a bid is thinking that maybe it is only worth uh, now 300 bucks, so then one would think that that loan, the, the assets which are underlying that loan, may be worth 300 bucks only. Well, I mean, a month after Lehman defaulted, its senior paper was trading at eight cents on the dollar, mm -hmm. traded up to 12 cents on the dollar after about a year, traded up to about 25 cents on the dollar five years after, ultimately had a, had a agreed upon bankruptcy uh, exit at uh, an undiscounted 21 cents on the dollar over five years starting about a year ago. So I mean, it's jumped around quite a bit as there was uh, progressive waves of Disclosure, Correct. right? I mean, the market doesn't have perfect information, especially in a, in a default where there's some complexity. Yes, so there's something to be said, I think, for either you know approach to loss given default, and we used the the market view. Um, uh, there are problems with that. There are also problems with the final workout amount, and uh, the people should know. That that's, you know, life. There there is a something to be said on either side, and let's not get too hung up in that. Uh, uh, I have done some. I I've never studied final recoveries to the formality of the market, but I have run a line through the gross data, and it looks just about as good. It's at a yeah, for what that's worth. <clears throat> From a commodity perspective, yeah. one could say one's a spot rate and the other's a forward rate. Uh, the spot rate being the workout rate, yeah. where it occurs, and what you're quoted today is the forward rate. Yes. Yes, that's right. The market is trying to anticipate the final recovery. Uh, uh, people are placing bets on what that final recovery might be. Of course, their information changes over time, and as a consequence, the market price changes. All that's true. And it's a complicating factor. So, the uh, using Moody's data historically, you know, that's what I've shown here. But gosh, here the blue line is a theory, the yellow line is reality. Hey, the two look kind of close. The thing worked pretty well on the data that we've had to date. The uh, and now I start my presentation. Okay, <laughs> and what I want to show you tonight is. This is apt to work, not just on what we've seen in the past. I'm going to make the claim this is apt to work on what we might see in the future. Now, of course, we don't know what kind of data the future will give us. So what this study does, it's called uh, LGD as a function of the default rate. It's on uh, my website. Uh, which you can get because this slide will be on your website. So all is well here. Uh, it's there, and you can take a look at it. Here's what I do. I consider that data might be generated from an entire range of different processes. And for each of those processes, I run a horse race. I run the LGD function as one of the contestants, and I say, well, if you weren't using the LGD function, you'd have to do something. And so I use linear regression. That's the other contestant. I compare the LGD function to OLS, and then I do really fancy called exact regression, which is so exact that nobody can understand that either. OK, so that's, that's a little bit of a problem with that section. But uh, OLS versus the function, which works better? And I can tell, because I generate the data, right? I know what the real model is. I simulate some data. I estimate that data with OLS. I fit it to the LGD function. I see which one estimates tail LGD better. That's the contest here.
And it turns out the LGD function wins. And there are basically two things involved there. One of them is the shortness of the data set, right? We can only go back to 1984. That's in junk bonds. In loans, most banks didn't even define default 10 years ago. The definition of default came into being because of Basel II. It's all recent stuff. Nobody has a long-term data set on default and LGD of loans. The concepts are just too new. So the short data set, you'll see, that really matters. And there's this other thing. LGD data is crummy. I don't know if you've been listening to this discussion, but there have been many comments made about the crumminess, the general crumminess of LGD data. And it's not just us. It's crummy, and it'll stay crummy, and there's nothing we can do about it. That's what I want to show you next. Here is one. We're looking into my computer now. Here is one simulation run. And the key thing here is this data generator. So this straight line here, for purposes of discussion, that represents the true underlying connection between the default rate still on the horizontal and the LGD rate that's on the vertical. This is the, this is the uh, source of my simulated data is this straight line. It's not because I think the straight line is good, yeah? No, I'm going to try lots and lots of different lines before I'm done. This is just one line. It's where we're starting out. Straight line data generator. Then I pick 10 points on that data generator. This represents 10 years of data. And you can see the 10 colored points along the dotted line. Uh, that's colored and like that. So I pick 10 points at random along the line. That's the first stage of the simulation. Like take this point. It says that a portfolio ought to default at an 8% rate. That's what the point is saying. Now I got a portfolio of 1,000 loans. Each one of them is expected to default at an 8% rate. See, but that you'd think, you'd expect, you know, 80 defaults. But of course, there's a binomial distribution around 80, right? Maybe you get 80, maybe you get 70, whatever you, you know, you get some other number quite commonly. And in this particular simulation run, given the random seeds that happen to be in my computer, you know, this instant, I didn't get 80 defaults, I got 61, okay? The, this year of data actually had a default rate of 6.1% on those 1,000 loans. There was an 8% chance that a firm would default. It turned out that only 61 firms defaulted. Okay, so that's sort of one year of data, you know, and there's a similar thing on the LGD, right? There's some randomness there. So you get off, the, so there's one year of data. And the same thing's happening at the other end. Down here, well, the default rate is real small, right? There aren't many defaults. So there aren't many LGDs. So portfolio LGD could be quite different from the line. Could be a lot higher, could be a lot lower, just because of randomness. And the, you know, here's a couple of points down here where uh, you know, they're quite a lot lower, just at random due to the, due to the simulation draw. So you know, there's the data generator that you'd really like to know by analysis. And there's the data you get, which is I'm using 10 data points here. It's about right. It's even generous for a lot of bank data sets. Using 10 data points and just showing that there are natural and unavoidable reasons why those points are not on the line. There's something different from the line. This particular bank, this particular simulation run, look what happened. In the good years, when default was low, the bank got lucky. Its LGDs were low, below the line, right? And in the bad years, when default rates were expected to be high, the bank was also lucky. It only had a 6% rate instead of an 8% rate, which, you know, lucky bank, low risk, right? And then look at the data swarm, though. Look what happens to the data swarm. It's not the line of the data generator. The data swarm is now something a lot steeper, see? So this randomness in the data that's unavoidable. You know, a thousand loans, a thousand corporate loans, that's a lot of loans, yeah? Even with a big portfolio, the, 
there's, nest, there's intrinsic to this problem, data will fall away from the true relationship. And that can point a regression line in any number of directions. Too steep, too shallow. In this case, too steep. So here's the comparison between the two. Here's the red regression line. The LGD function, same darn thing we've been looking at. You know, same shape, maybe adjusted up and down. And then the true underlying relationship, the data generator. I've shown the target here. We're trying to estimate the 98th percentile of LGD. That's the right number. And it's 72% or so. That's the target. The regression line, way too steep, you know, misses it. The LGD function, hey, it's too shallow, right? The data generator has one slope. The LGD function has a different slope, a, sh a shallower slope. And there's nothing we can do about that because the LGD function always has the same slope, right? It just, it, you can't affect that. So the, this thing makes an estimate too high. This thing makes an estimate too low, but it's closer to the right number than this thing there. The LGD function beats the regression on that particular simulation run. Excuse me for talking through that, but this is sort of the essence of it. These are the problems that you encounter with regression. The darn line points the wrong way because there's only 10 points here that are backing it up. And let's consider in greater detail. I simulated the data using a linear data, data generator and then I analyzed the data with linear regression. You'd think I would be giving linear regression something of an advantage, you know, and I am. I'm not, look. Second, I used the data generator that's quite a lot steeper than the LGD function. I could have made the LGD function look better by using a, a shallower data generator. So even if the data generator is too steep, that's OK. You know, I can beat the regression, and uh, at least I did once. You know, I've shown you that. And you'd think this would help, too. The regression actually looks at the shape of the data swarm. You'd think that would help, but it didn't. By looking at the data swarm, the regression was misled. The line was too steep. So uh, these are the problems that we encountered on one simulation run. Now I'm going to just show you 10,000, the result of 10,000 simulation runs with exactly the same setup. Everything is exactly the same except the random number generators. And this is what you get. Here's the number you're trying to estimate, 72%. Here's the data, the, the, the histogram for the LGD function. And, you know, there's this nice tight grouping here, but what do you know? There, you know, generally, it's too low. It's a biased estimator because the slope isn't steep enough. Can't change the slope, you know. That's, that's baked in. So you have this nice, tight distribution, but it's, you know, it's not perfect. You know, there it is. And here's what you get, you know, with, L, with OLS. This is the histogram of projections of the, we're trying to estimate the 98th percentile loss given default. In the case we looked at, you know, we were estimating about 80. We were in this bar out here. I didn't want to show you something really extreme. It looks unbelievably bad. You can't believe, you, uh, you wouldn't, I would have even less credibility <laughs> if I showed you one of these cases out here. But look at it. This regression is saying that LGD at the 98th percentile is going to be 100 or 110 percent. You know, there are cases like that. On the other hand, it goes all the way down to in the 50s. And isn't that interesting? It's bimodal. Don't a lot of creditless models have fat tail distributions? Um, yes, and that element, uh, we ought to control the risk control. You know, we ought, to, uh, we ought to focus on accuracy and try to cut down those tails and not make people think that there's enormous risk or practically none. That, we ought to try to come up with the right an uh, close to the right answer. That's the point here. And that also drives economic capital, right? You bet it does. If you happen to be working on a regression that shows this much risk, well, you've got a bunch of risk. You think. You think you have a bunch of risk. Anybody figured out? Well, I'm going to take another drink of water here, but anybody figure out why there's two modes on the red? It's a trick question. Uh, the, you know, uh, sorry. 
It's a trick question. If you do a regression, then do you always use the result? No, you test it for statistical significance, right? This is principally regressions that were found to be significant. But believe me, when banks estimate, when banks analyze LGD and default data, they quite often find a lack of statistical significance. They cannot reject the hypothesis that LGD is not sensitive to default. And those banks wind up, would wind up in this node, this mode, this, uh, what do you call it, mode, uh, something like that. It's, uh, mode, yeah. They would wind up down here. These are regressions that are, not all of them, but they are principally not statistically significant. These are statistically significant. That's why there's two modes. And of course you think, well, what if you just use them, whether they're significant or not, you know? Wouldn't, it turns out that doesn't help either. I don't want to show that, but take my word, that doesn't help. The point is that the blue is closer to 72.3 on average than the spread out distribution of the red. The LGD function outperforms uh, OLS on, you know, again, those are 10,000 identical simulations. They all use the same values of the control variables. So you might wonder, what if the control variables were different? You know, with different PD, different expected LGD, different slope of the data generator. I tried all that. I changed every <clears throat> one of the control, uh, control parameters over wide range. You can see charts of how that comes out in the article. Uh, the number of firms in the in the loans in the portfolio, I made a big deal of how that adds randomness. You might think if you had infinitely number, you know, an infinite number of loans instead of a thousand, that that would solve your problems. Turns out it doesn't. That doesn't help. Number of years. I only use 10 years. This turns out to be the money ball. That's what matters. Number of years of data, and to a lesser extent, the slope of the data generator. In the example you saw, the data generator was steeper than the function, but not a heck of a lot. You know, it was steeper, but not greatly steeper. If you crank that data generator steep enough, then it produces data, data swarms that are steep enough that they're worth looking at by regression. But So there's basically two ways to beat this function. One of them is to get more data. And, uh, uh, more than 10 years in any case that I looked at. Uh, and then how much data do you need, you know, to actually, so that your regression outperforms the function? Well, in some, you know, some sets of control variables, you only need uh, 20 years of data to do better than the function. In other sets, you know, you need a, you need a hundred. Uh, if it turns out you know, that the LGD function is actually a good description. I'm just saying here. But if it turns out that the null hypothesis actually is an adequate description of the data generation process, then maybe you need an infinite number of years, okay, to beat this, because the LGD function is always going to tend to be right. So you need a bunch of years, and uh, you don't have them. There's no way. You know, you're not going back to get 100 years of this stuff, you don't have it available. And uh, here's the thing too, you know, when I say years, uh, all I can count are independent draws that are simulated within my computer. You know, you need 20 independent observations or 100 independent observations. But if you're actually drawing data, credit loss data, real world credit loss data, is highly serially dependent, right? What you find out in a, any given year is half of it is a rehash of the previous year. You know, what's happening now in credit markets, regrettably, is highly correlated with what happened in 2008. You know, we're still correlated with something that happened five years ago and we're trying to break free of it. With a computer, no problem. Every year, you know, as an independent observation, you get 100% fresh information every year. Those of you who uh, can have your econometric training, you know, re-stimulated here. Uh, you remember this, there, there was that, uh, there's that test, you know, that statistic, 
the Durban Watson that's got to be less than two or more than two or some darn thing. You know, if you have autocorrelated data and you ignore that, you'll think you find significance, but you don't. You don't have as much information as you think. And with real world data, that tends to be the case. Each year is partly just a rehash of the previous year. So you need a bunch of data, 20 or 100 years, even if you simulate this stuff. In the real world, you need more than that. The other way you can beat the function is if the world really has, or the, the, the lending that you're undertaking really has a lot more LGD risk than this function has, you would pick that up more quickly in a data set. So you know these two things interact. Uh, if the LGD uh, generator is, is, is shallow, uh, you're going to need a whole bunch of data. If it's extremely steep, you could pick that up quicker. So the, uh, you know, while you're waiting for that 100 years of data to accumulate, I'm going to put forward that this is not a bad way to go. This is, uh, you know, it's consistent with the historical data. You got to say it was a lucky call, right? I mean, it was almost exactly consistent with the historical data. But I'll accept that bit of luck. Uh, it's, uh, I made this noise earlier. This approach is sort of deeply simple. It's consistent with an ex the most simple credit model that's ever been proposed. Uh, it's easy to apply. You saw that. There's only one parameter. It goes up or down. Uh, it does uh, assign risk to every exposure, whether or not you have the data to prove that that risk is there or not. It survives testing. And it's apt to continue to perform well, you know, if uh, Can I suggest maybe one or two questions? Good. Yes. So is there any implication or application to um, Basel II or how a, a bank could use these models to set up and satisfy Basel? I have a slide that addresses that. Here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> how I wish it were true. Um, but, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve is, like all of us, initially resistant, but seeks to do better. Well, one might hope. One, do, one does hope. Progress will be made. Uh, we'll see. How was that? Is anybody here from the Fed? Am I going to get killed, <laughs> Am I going to get killed for that, Andy? Uh, yeah, Lusheng? Yeah. Yeah. There, yes. Well, if you were to run a regression, you would choose, you know, an intercept and a slope. With this, all you get to choose is the level. It's, you know, so it's a choice parameter. Right now it's set at 5.0, uh, but you could set that differently. And the key thing that determines, there's a formula, of course, for K. You know, it's rigorously defined. But the key thing is, what LGD do you expect? And if you expect LGD to be high, you just ram the line up higher. The value of K is less. Because of economic stress. Uh, the reason that you would do that, like for example, if you had a loan that was well secured, over collateralized, uh, with liquid collateral, all those good things, so you expect a low LGD, well, you're going to choose one of the lines that are down here. Unsecured lending, one of the lines that are up there. That's the deal. This is more account. The implication of that is something that is well secured with a greater percent variation. Dan, you're so right about that. And um, it was uh, thinking along those lines actually led me ultimately to this way of looking at things. I think that is so, the point here, uh, that Dan, and for those that don't have it on amplification, let me just answer this one question because this is in fact near and dear to my heart. The, and I see this as a professor. Well, I'm not a professor, but I see it as a 
wage slave. Down at, I teach at the USC. So I have a bunch of students, right? And I can guarantee you this. The bad students will never disappoint you as an instructor. It's the good students, yeah, that are the ones that can break your heart. And it's the same way with LGD. You know, if you're unsecured, if it's an unsecured loan, and you think you're going to lose 80 points on the dollar anyway, then who cares if LGD is higher or lower? You're, if it's 70 or 90, who cares? It doesn't matter. But it's the highly secured stuff, over collateralized. You're going into it, you really think it's almost impossible to lose anything. You set your LG, you expect that LGD at like 5%. And then when that goes to 25, you know, in a downturn, that's the one that stings you. It's always the, it's always the one where your expectation going in is good. That's the one that'll kill you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Join me in thanking John and uh, <laughs>